again, Wong Sui Speaks, and in this BNF bite sized style video, I'm going to be going through pain. So I realised that pain isn't a topic which I've really focused on in previous videos, which is why I wanted to make this one. So the different types of pain and also how it can be classified as well as drug treatments. So I hope you like this video and if you do, please do give it a thumbs up, share, like, subscribe, also visit my Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. So pain can be described in many ways. Two classifications that we're going to look at is neuropathic pain and nociceptive pain. Don't know if I'm saying nociceptive, probably. Apologies if I'm not, but let's go with it. So our neuropathic pain, they tend not to respond very well to our conventional analgesics. And by conventional analgesics, I mean paracetamol, NSAIDs, etc. Whereas nociceptive pain, that responds a lot better to our conventional analgesics. With neuropathic pain, it could be damage due to neural tissue, including peripheral neuropathy, which could be a diabetic complication, for example. It could be due to chemotherapy treatment. Um, it could be due to chronic excessive alcohol, HIV infection, etc. Or it could be due to trauma. So, for example, central pain or after shingles, having post hepatic neuralgia. There are various treatments um, available, so it could be, for example, tricyclic antidepressants, um, some anti-epileptics such as gabapentin, um, or if there isn't a response to these, then we may need to try something strong, like, or even stronger, such as um, oxycodone. If the pain is more localised, though, then the patient might actually benefit from having a topical anaesthetic, such as medicated um, lidocaine plasters. Alternatively, there is capsaicin, which is available as both a cream or a patch, and that can also be used, but it can cause an intense burning sensation, so it does put off some people um, using it. So that was our neuropathic pain. So looking more about that nociceptive pain, so we said it responds much better to paracetamol, NSAIDs, etc. And it is the most common type of pain which is experienced and probably something we've all experienced at some point, whether that be dental pain, sports injury, etc. So pain can be classified as acute or chronic. When we talk about chronic pain, it's usually pain which lasts for over 12 weeks. It can affect quality of life. It can be quite, it can cause significant suffering, disability, and can be quite complex. Now, chronic pain can be due to multiple reasons. For example, osteoarthritis, musculoskeletal conditions, and chronic pain and neuropathic pain sometimes do come in hand in hand. Now, generally with pain, if we can also look at non-pharmacological drug treatment, non-pharmacological treatment methods, um, We'll focus on pharmacological methods as well, but if we look at what options there are with non-pharmacological methods, there is, for example, exercise therapies, CBT, transcutaneous electric nerve stimulation, all of which, if appropriate, they can be recommended in the management of chronic pain as well. Now, focusing more on those pharmacological treatments, if we think about pain in general, and especially the pain pathway, we usually start off with paracetamol. If needs be, we might add on an NSAID or replace it with an NSAID. If that doesn't help, then we might resort to codeine or tramadol. And if that doesn't help, then we're gonna look at some really strong stuff. So morphine, oxycodone, for example. So if we look at our non-opioids, so we've got paracetamol, we've also got our NSAIDs. Now with our NSAIDs, we can again further break that down into those that are non-selective and those that are selective. So those that are non-selective are our ibuprofen, diclofenac, naproxen, etc. Whereas with our selective, they are our coccibs. So for example, celecoxib. Now all NSAIDs, they do have, um, they are associated with a risk of GI toxicity. So our highest risk of serious upper GI um, is, for example, peroxicam, ketoprofen, and a really fun one to say, ketorolac tromitamol. Um, our intermediate risk are our indomethacin, diclofenac, and our naproxen, and lowest risk is ibuprofen. With our selective, um, selective COX-2 inhibitors, they are associated with a lower risk of serious upper GI side effects. So there's still a risk, but a lot lower. 
If we think about cardiovascular events, so we get our COX-2 selective inhibitors, our diclofenac when it's given at 150 milligrams daily, and our ibuprofen when it's given at 2.5 grams daily, that's associated with the highest risk of thrombotic effect, uh, events. Whereas naproxen given at one grams daily is associated with a lower thrombotic risk and low dose of ibuprofen, so less than 1.2 grams daily, that's not really associated with an increased risk of myocardial infarctions. So those were looking at our non-opioids. If we now look at our opioids, so we have our mild to moderate opioids such as codeine and we have our moderate to severe ones such as morphine. Now, the long-term need for an opioid really depends on a patient's tolerance, uh, their dependence, safety profile. Also need to take into account the formulation, so patient factors, maybe a patch would be more suitable than oral medication, for example, and also looking at their risk of side effects as well. So with paracetamol and with ibuprofen in children, I do recommend learning the um, doses that are associated with each of those age groups, because that is something that they could ask in the part two paper in the pre-reg exam. Now, bear in mind in the part two paper, you won't be allowed a calculator, so it's not going to be a complicated calculation that they'll ask you, but it could be, for example, in a six-year-old child, um, what dose of paracetamol or what strength of paracetamol is recommended. So with both paracetamol and ibuprofen, and in the case of children, and like with many medicines for children, the doses can be based on weight. So, but sometimes there is sort of general um, ranges that can be given based on age and what doses can be given as well. Um, and that's what I'll be more sort of focusing on in this next section. So with paracetamol solution, it's available as 120 milligrams per five mil and as 250 milligrams per five mil. So, and whether, so whether you use the SPC to remember this information and learn this information or use the BNF, it's worth noting that there is subtle differences. So with the SPC, um, you'll be able to find section, the, this information in section 4.2. And there, if we, if we look at, for example, the 120 milligram per five mil paracetamol um, SP, an SPC for that, and I'll include a link in the description box below. It, it, it summarises it quite nicely because it will have the age ranges and it focuses on more on the mils. So you give 2.5 mils, 5 mils, 7.5 mils, 10 mils, etc. And so you, you can kind of see that as the age increases, um, the increments of 2.5 mils steadily goes up and up, up until we get to about 8 to 10 years old. And then instead of going up by 2.5 mils, it goes up by 5 mils. So um, that's worth noting. Whereas in the BNF, the BNF, um, the age ranges vary slightly in that in an SPC, you might, for example, have four to eight years old. With a, within the BNF, it will break it down further. So you have four to five years old, uh, six to seven years old, eight to nine years old, etc. And with the BNF, it looks more at the actual strength in milligrams. So you might need to, it might recommend 120 milligrams. It might recommend 240 milligrams, might recommend 250 milligrams, etc. Whether you want to learn this information from the BNF or you want to learn it from the SPC or you want to use a combination of the two is absolutely fine. It's just worth bearing in mind those little differences of how that information is laid out compared to the two. And bear in mind that once you've learned one set, so for example, if you want to learn um, the doses in mils, just remember that if you are using, for example, 120 milligrams per five mil, actually what those mils mean in milligrams and therefore what strength you would require. Equally, if you're going to use a BNF and you're going to look at what milligrams are required, then ensure that you know how to then convert that into the relevant um, dose that you would actually give to the patient as well. So would that be 2.5 mils? Would that be five mils, etc.? So ensuring that you know what conversion you're doing is very key when looking at milligrams and mils. And the same can be said with ibuprofen. So again, with ibuprofen, it very much depends on the weight. Um, ibuprofen is available in the strength of 100 milligrams per five mil in most pharmacies. Um, and again, it's the same thing where depending whether you're looking at the SPC or you're looking at the BNF, the breakdown in ages may vary ever so slightly and the SPC tends to display the information as mils, whereas the BNF will explain it more in milligrams. 
When I was learning this um, particular area, what I found really useful actually was to create a table and have the ages, the doses and the frequency. And then I would stick that somewhere and keep revisiting it to try and remind myself what that information was. Um, that helped me. And so hopefully that will help you too. And I hope you liked this video. And if you did, don't forget to check out my playlists as well. So I've got playlists on high weighted topics, medium weighted topics, low weighted topics, playlists on advice, on calculations, on uh, respiratory, all different playlists. So make sure that you do look at that as well. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I really do appreciate your love and support. So until next time, good luck with your revision and happy revisings.